This is a lens that tells a story. Regardless of whether you're shooting photo or video, having a lens that can immerse your viewer in the environment and make them feel like they are part of the scene that you are photographing or taking a video of is an extremely powerful thing. Now, this is a 12 millimeter F2 by Brighton Star, but there are four other lenses that I can recommend that are very similar to this lens. Now, this lens was sent out to me for the purpose of making this video. All the opinions are my own, and this is not a paid or sponsored video. I'll put a link to this lens, but I'll also put the four other lenses that are very similar to this that I would recommend. And if you already have one of those lenses, then you probably don't need a lens like this. But this is a great budget offering and does have a few advantages over some of the other lenses in the list. And the first thing a lens like this is going to be good for is cinematic video. And often when we think of ultra wide angle lenses like this, we think about GoPros or action cameras, but ultra wide angle lenses are used in cinematic video all the time. And you've seen it in many of your favorite Hollywood movies. And that 12 to 13 millimeter focal length that this lens falls into is a perfect Goldilocks focal length, which allows you to get a person in a scene and show a wide ranging environment wrapping around them without having too much distortion on their face. But you do get what is called perspective distortion, which is not a lens fault or flaw. It is a character of wide angle lenses where when you bring that person reasonably close to the lens, you get them and they are quite prominent in the scene and it pushes everything behind them back out and around them, creating this environmental portrait or this environmental type shot. But the other thing you can do is you can actually bring the lens closer to a person's face and get this crazy distorted shot, which you also often see in Hollywood movies and cinematic sequences. And it's this kind of totally surreal image which distorts their facial features, but makes you feel like you're sort of right there in the scene. You're almost nose to nose with the person that you're taking a video of. So there's a number of different ways you can use this lens and its perspective distortion to create these incredible cinematic sequences. The other thing it's great for is establishing shots. And this is when you have a big wide environment and you want to show that whole scene at the beginning of a sequence to let people know that all the close-ups and more close-in shots that you're gonna see later in the scene are set in this environment. And a wide angle lens like this is gonna work for a big broad landscape, but it's also going to work for sort of tight rooms and small environments where you wanna set that scene and, and put somebody in that scene and let them know where all these different shots are coming from. And all these same characteristics that make it so good for cinematic video also make it an excellent environmental portrait lens. Now, this is not a lens that you're necessarily going to be getting very close to someone, but you don't have to get very far away from them to really show a person and the environment that they're in. And this is the whole point of environmental portrait. The other thing that's great about a 12 or 13 millimeter focal length for video is that a lens this wide is going to often work very, very well with a camera that has in-body image stabilization or compatible digital image stabilization. In addition to that, if you have none of those things, as long as you shoot at a reasonably high shutter speed, you can stabilize that in editing and get a very smooth and very good result. So this is excellent for video when you want to shoot a tracking shot or following somebody in a scene. The other thing that this focal length is going to be great for is landscape photography. Now, I will say that wide angle landscape photography is one of the most challenging forms of photography, but also one of the most rewarding once you get it right. And to use a wide angle lens in landscape, you do need a more immersive environment. You need an environment that sort of wraps all around you. And this lens is often would often be good for something like in a forest or if you're in a mountains, but down in a valley, you don't want to be shooting a mountain way off in the distance. You want to be in the landscape and capturing that wraparound landscape. The other thing about a wide lens like this is it's going to pick up a fair bit of the foreground and the foreground is going to be reasonably prominent. So you want to try to get a shot that has some foreground in it and really think about your composition as far as what's in the foreground, what's in the midground, what's in the background. So. A challenging focal length for landscape photography, but I think an essential one and one that really, if you master, I think you could be pretty proud of the photos that you're gonna get with a lens like this. The other absolute default use for a lens like this is real estate photography, because this is the type of lens that you see all the time, real estate photos, apartment photos, where they get 
a room and they make it look a little bit bigger than what it really is and you get that full wraparound image of the room and it just makes everything look great and bigger and potentially nicer than what it is. But this focal length and this field of view is an absolute standard for real estate photography. If you're getting this lens for travel and all these other purposes, you can use it as a multi-purpose real estate lens. And actually, if you're interested in doing real estate photography, Airbnb has a system that you can sign up for. And it's like very simple to get in. You just put up some sample photos and you can become an Airbnb sort of local real estate photographer. And it's a pretty simple way to get in. And you could do it with a lens like this. This would really be the only lens you need. It's also gonna be an excellent all-purpose photo and video lens for travel. Once again, because it is a wide lens, you're getting a lot of that environment around the people that you're with, you're gonna get them in that environment. And because you're getting so much in the scene, it's also a lens that you can use in what I would call a snapshot style lens, which means that you're not really thinking too much about image composition and your foreground and your background and nailing all that you might just see something that you want to remember. You point the camera at it, you press the shutter, and with that big wide angle, you're gonna get the whole scene in. And later, if you wanna crop in on a part of the image that you thought was the most interesting, you can do that. But well, a wide lens like this is just gonna be a perfect snapshot lens. Turn, point, shoot, you know you got everything. The other thing this lens should be very good for is astrophotography. I have not had a chance to test it for astro yet, but lenses of this focal range, 13, 14 millimeters, with an maximum aperture of f2 to f1.4 are generally excellent for astrophotography. And really any of the lenses that I've got recommended down below, bar the one that is f2.8, will work really well for astrophotography. Looking at the build and handling on the lens, it is an all manual focus manual aperture lens. It has a very smooth manual focus ring and the aperture ring is a clicked aperture ring. It comes with a plastic rear and front lens cap. It's based on a metal lens mount and it has a very strange screw on metal lens hood, which I've never seen before. It screws on similar to the way a filter would screw on. And I kind of assumed that maybe at some point it wouldn't stop in the right position, but when you get it tight, it, it is in the the right position, but it is a bit of an odd one. But overall, it is an excellently built lens. And of all the lenses that I've tested around this focal length and aperture, it is the smallest. So I think if there's one advantage this lens does have over a number of the other similar lenses, it is the size because it is a very small lens. It's available on most of the popular APS-C mounts. I think it is available on Micro Four Thirds as well, but I will put those links in the description down below so you can go and see which lens mounts it is available on. Looking at the distortion performance on the lens, it is excellent and it is probably the best distortion performance that I've seen of a lens this wide and at this price point. The lines are so incredibly straight and I don't know exactly how they've done it, particularly considering how small the lens is, but excellent performance as far as distortion goes. Having a look at vignette, this lens does exhibit reasonably heavy vignette throughout the entire aperture range and it doesn't really go away. And I think this is possibly a product of how small the lens is, that the optics just aren't big enough to give an image that doesn't have reasonably heavy vignette. I haven't corrected vignette in any of the photos or any of the videos you've seen in this video so far. So. If you're happy with the way those look, then you're gonna be happy with the vignette performance. You can correct it in Lightroom if you want. When it comes to chromatic aberration, in the in-focus areas, there really is no chromatic aberration or purple fringing to speak of. I would say that this performance is near on um, perfect. When it comes to longitudinal chromatic aberration, which is a change in color in the out-of-focus areas before and after the plane of focus, it does exhibit reasonably heavy longitudinal chromatic aberration, particularly if you have out of focus background, which is, which is trees against a bright sky, you do get heavy purple fringing. But once again, in everything that you've seen in this video, I have not corrected it at all. It is noticeable in some scenes, but it's not something that I would be too concerned about. Looking at the flare results, this is really a mixed bag. There was a lot of shots that I took that I thought flare would be a problem in, and they just weren't a problem at all. But there are certain scenes when light is coming from just outside of frame generally, not in the shot, but just outside of the shot, where it will hit that big bulbous front element on the lens at a certain angle, and the image will immediately flare and become quite desatur desaturated. This can look a bit cinematic and 
faded film look, but it is not considered a desirable trait. It wasn't hard to control because I could just turn the lens or just turn the composition a little bit and get rid of that. But when I went fishing for it, I could get this lens to flare reasonably badly. And it wasn't traditional lens streak flares coming across the frame. It was a heavy desaturation of the image when the flare did sort of rear its head. The close-up image quality with the lens is good without being great. I think a number of the other lenses that I've got listed below that are alternatives to this lens are probably better at getting a closer focus and a more detailed image. When you did get close focus, and on this lens it was about 18 centimeters, the images were reasonably good without being perfect. So I think the close-up image quality is okay, but if you're somebody that is really really love to get those really close up wide angle images, which are really interesting and can create kind of a surreal result, then this probably wouldn't be the lens at the top of my list. If you're doing it occasionally, I think it's good enough. Looking at sharpness and detailed rendered in the lens, it is good without being gray. It is reasonably sharp in the center of frame. Like most of these wide angle lenses, as you get to the corner, things get a little bit more stretched and blurry, but that's pretty standard. As you stop the lens down, it gets sharper and sharper. And in the landscape photos and some of the photos that I've taken on the ship, I have stopped the aperture down quite a bit, f5.6, f8. Once you get to those levels, the image is absolutely razor sharp through a good portion of the frame. But I think overall, as far as the sharpness and detail performance on the lens goes, I think it's completely acceptable at the price point, but it's not necessarily mind-blowing or anything. And looking at bokeh or background blur, if you do get close to your subject, you can get an out-of-focus background. And when you do, it does look reasonably smooth and nice. It's not something that is a feature of wide-angle lenses. You don't really get a whole lot of deeply out-of-focus areas. But when you do, I think the out-of-focus areas are pleasing and fine, and I have absolutely no problem with them. If you're an APS-C shooter and you don't have a 12 or 13 millimeter lens with a maximum aperture of somewhere between f2 and f1.4, then I really do think you're missing out. And it doesn't have to be this Brighton Star lens, but one of the lenses in that list in the description, I think, is a lens that every APS-C shooter should have in their bag. And if you want to know what is my very favorite wide-angle lens on an APS-C sensor camera, I've just thrown a video on screen now. In this video, I review it on a Fuji camera, but it is now available on a range of different lens mounts.